Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to this February meeting of the Delaware Astronomical Society. We do have a lot of announcements, so we need to get started pretty quickly uh, so that we can get to our wonderful speaker. Uh, so number one, do we have any new members or guests that would like to introduce themselves? Yep, I'll turn this around for you. <laughs> Go for it. Hello, I'm Craig Depps uh, from Smyrna, Delaware. I'm new to astronomy. Um, I actually joined the club about a year ago, but uh, came to one meeting and I've made it back since. So I reintroduced myself. My name is Craig, and I'm uh, joy to be here. Welcome. Welcome, Welcome back, Craig. Craig. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, yeah. Next. Uh, Dave Hunter, I used to be uh, 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 a while back, yeah, yeah. and uh, I just thought I would. Like to get back into wonderful. I'm well, done observing at home um, on my own air property, but uh, not a lot out. Well, welcome to the club. Wonderful. Welcome. Anybody else? All right. All right. Then let's get started. Uh, can I just want to say? Yep. I love the three people. Is a V here? How about Larry Korsky? Or James Robin. Okay. Nope. Don't think so. Are they all paid? <laughs> so they pay. I think they're students for some reason. Yeah. I think they're students. Well, my two cents would be what I said well, before. If you can factor that I have an extra calendar and somebody wants one, they're seven dollars. So I have, I would have an extra calendar. There we go. Excellent. We have a ticket. Very good. I have the money in the car. Very good. All right. Next item. Uh, Sydney, you want to announce the uh, Yeah. Uh, I just want to mention that it's uh, that time of year where it's the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer for the Delaware Astronomical Society. If you are a member of good standing, and believe that you'd like to run for one of these positions, send me an email at sid, S -I -D, astronomy at yahoo.com with a little write up. And uh, yeah, we'll put your name in. Uh, that, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. All right, very good. Thanks. And then, speaking of members in good standing, Bob, you want to tell us about the uh, members dues? that aren't good standing? <laughs> <laughs> so, in the process of collecting dues over 2024, so dues remain $30. Uh, if you haven't paid yet, we'd like to encourage you to pay quickly so that you can vote in the election. Because uh, at the end of February, if, you, if you're not signed up, we have to take you off our active roster uh, list and, and, and you don't get to vote or run in the election. Uh, but yeah, so I'm here if, if anyone wants to pay. Uh, right now we have about 128 members. Uh, uh, so so uh, if you haven't paid, I should have sent you an email a couple days ago as a reminder, a final reminder. Uh, and so I encourage you to, to sign up. All right, thank you very much. And then next, Chris, you want to tell us about the filter workshop coming sure. up this weekend? Yes, hello. I sent uh, two messages, but this is the final reminder. This Saturday at 9 a.m. to noon, I'm hosting a little workshop on building a solar filter. Um, the DAS is providing the solar filter material. Um, everyone else is bringing supplies, and I'm bringing some uh, foam board. And I'll be going through a how to tutorial on how to make a solar filter for white light uh, observing. So, sunspots um, and the partial solar eclipse if you're here, or the total solar eclipse if you're lucky enough to be traveling somewhere. Um, so, we have extra solar film if anyone's interested in joining. Uh, but this is the last call. And folks should bring their gear that they're making this filter yes, for. Please bring oh, yeah. uh, your telescope or binoculars uh, with you. Um, you don't have to. You can do an inner diameter measurement and outer diameter measurement, and we can figure it out. But it would be a lot easier if you bring it with you. Um, so yeah, if you have, if you want to join uh, and attend, send me an email, and I'll get the information, get you set up. And effectively, that's all people really need to bring. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have, I think, with everyone bringing supplies, uh, we have enough if we are polite and share, and we should be good to go. Very good. Thanks. And then next item, Greg, you wanted to talk about a book, I think? Yeah, uh, we ran the uh, introductory to astronomy class uh, a while back. And in connection with that, we ordered a few of these Nightwatch books, which are great introductory books. This is in its fifth 
edition. It's been around for a long, long time. And uh, sadly, Terry Dickinson passed just this last summer, just as this was being finished. So this is the newest updated version. We had one left over. It's now going to be in the library for your loans. I'll put it up here. You can thumb through it if you want. Check it out in the library. All right, very cool. And then, um, Jeff, you want to tell us about the dinner meeting? Yeah. Uh, so we will once again be holding our dinner meeting as we've been doing, I've lost track, 10 years now. Um, it'll be at, well, it will likely be at the same venue last year, St. Thomas Episcopal Church in Newark. Um, same format as last year, $20 per person. Um, we'll get you a meal, the venue, a speaker, um, and a lot of fun. Um, typically, we offer water and soft drinks with that, and we will have beer and wine available with it for a, as a free will donation. Um, third Tuesday of May, which I believe is the 21st, yeah. you will start seeing announcements on the Focus and through the groups.io and all the other usual channels. So I guess we could say uh, quasi save the date, May 21st. Uh, again, we'll have our dinner meeting as we've held it in the past. Um, if anyone has not been to a dinner meeting and is curious, um, most people in the room have been to at least one. So talk to someone after the meeting. And um, again, it's a very, very nice event. There's, you can see photos from the past events in usually the, uh, the June focus will have photos from the May meeting. Um, but yeah, obviously if there's questions, come and talk to someone after the meeting tonight. Okay. Another exciting thing that we're doing right now is we're going to get people trained in using the saw one and open that up. You want to talk about that, Chris? Um, sure. So we will have them come out. I think the groups will have to be limited to five or so at a time, and we're going to go through them as the groups as quickly as we can. We'll get instructions on how to open the saw and use the saw and close the saw and then there will be separate instructions how to use each of the five telescopes down there. Um, so there is a process ahead of time. So I'll put it out in an announcement on group IO and people will reply to it and we'll get the process started. We're thinking it'll probably be late daylight on a Tuesday or a Saturday afternoon. And we can get you set up for gate code and uh, Go to install one and you can get up and start using it. So, awesome. That, that's coming soon. Thank you very much. And uh, next, the AP say, Bill? Yes. Uh, last couple of meetings, the December and January meetings were on site. So February, the plan is to do that on Zoom. And the details will go out over the groups.io uh, uh, DAS group. Uh, at this point, I expect to start about one o'clock on Saturday. And uh, that's it for the moment. Thank you very much. And Mary, did you want to say something about the Moat Club? Uh, yes, we'd like to invite everyone and their guests to attend the DAS Book Club meeting on Thursday evening, February 29th, Leap Day at 7 p.m., our usual time via Zoom. Links will be sent out to all members uh, the week of the meeting. And the subject of our meeting will be a discussion of a paper written by Dr. Barbara Becker, how William Huggins shaped astrophysics. And we're delighted that Dr. Becker will be joining us for our meeting to discuss the paper. She is the leading expert in the life and work of the English astronomers, William and Margaret Huggins. Uh, this year marks the bicentenary of the birth of William Huggins. So you'll be seeing articles in all of the um, astronomy magazines and journals and websites about M Huggins this year. And so um, uh, the, the uh, paper has been emailed to everyone. If you have not received it, reach out to me and I will send a copy to you. Dr. Becker has authorized the um, 
sending of this paper to the members of the DAS and their guests in preparation for the meeting. It's a short paper. It's only about five um, pages. She did write a book on the subject. So if you wanted to continue with your reading, you could extend it to read her book. But you're all welcome to join us. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, Jim Kirshen. Is there any upcoming outreach events that we need to know about? Hello, you're muted. Okay, yes, uh, there is um, there's one upcoming. Um, it's March 6th, uh, 2024 from 8 p.m. to 9.30. It's at the Newark uh, Free Library. Um, our um, featured uh, featured guest speaker is um, is Sheila Vincent sitting next to uh, Sydney back uh, in the back. Uh, she's going to be our constellation uh, storyteller extraordinaire uh, for the um, for the children. Um, we've uh, we've looked at the venue. <laughs> We looked at the venue uh, for um, the Newark Free Library, and it doesn't look very it doesn't look very great for any sort of observation. But we will probably probably be able to see Jupiter uh, and its moons uh, from um, from that site. We've looked we've looked at that, but we'll, we won't see won't see much else. Mm -hmm. um, we had. Um, uh, this past week, we had a um, outreach event at the Wilming uh, at um, in uh, Chad's Ford for the Wilmington's Friends School, and um, prior to that, on the fe on February 9th, we had a, a Coco and Constellations uh, outreach event with the Newark uh, uh, Public Works Department at um, the, um, the Newark Reservoir, and all those uh, events uh, went over. Uh, very well. So, um, but the next one is at is um, on March sixth at the Newark Free Library. So that's about it. All I've got. All right. Very nice. Thank you very much. I did I miss anybody? That was a lot. <laughs> Great. All right. Without further ado, we can get started with the main talk. All right. Let me turn this up. I don't like having to announce speaker with notes. But um, our speaker tonight has done so much stuff, there's no way I can keep it all on my head. So we are joined tonight by Peter Dedeline, who, I mean, I'll just hit a couple of highlights here. The big one, 35 years, he was the director of the Boyertown Planetarium. Uh, claims to have brought over half a million people through, which is wow. pretty awesome. Wow. Um, in addition to that, teaches at the Montgomery County Community College, and the is is that is that different or connected to the Montana Learning Center? Uh, yeah, that's connected in with the Montana Learning Center. Yeah, okay. Montana State University. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Um, actually had a really cool experience. We won't be hearing about that one tonight, but had a sounds like a pretty cool experience going down to the large observatories in Chile. Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe most relevant and <clears throat> connected to his talk tonight. He is the observatory director for the Mars Society, um, where he heads up an astronomy team providing a solar and robotic telescope for the members at the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. So anyhow, uh, tonight, again, we are joined and please welcome Peter Deadline, sharing a talk on stars to Mars. Peter, sorry. There we go. All yours. Yeah. And I should be there. We're good to go. Yes. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Wonderful to be here to talk to you tonight. And let's start off with a show of hands. How many of you would like to go to Mars? Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. I'm not interested that much in the people with their hands up. I'm just looking at the hecklers from the hands down. I just you know, so you're located. Okay, thank you. Today we're talking about the red planet, and I want to I want to do this in three parts. I want to talk about NASA and China and Russia. When are we going to Mars? Who's going to Mars? What's the current timetable? Like we know that's not going to change. And the second part, 
when we get people there, what is a settlement on Mars actually going to look like? And in the third part, could we, and if we can, should we do astronomy on Mars? What would be possible there? What makes it better than Earth? What makes it worse than Earth? Let's take a look. Less light <laughs> so NASA's mission to Mars begins with the moon. They want to go to the moon first and then go to Mars because the moon they feel would be a good place to test equipment and all sorts of things that they would need on Mars, even though the moon and Mars are two very different types of worlds. And part of this is setting up what we call the lunar gateway. Think of it like a space station around the moon, but not really a space station. People will be staying there, but not full time. It won't be fully staffed all the time. The gateway is not up there yet. We're expecting that to go up in November 2025. Last year, let's see, it was November 2024. So we've added another year on since last for that. And then the first crew to actually visit there in September of 2026. Once you get to the gateway, then you can go down to the moon, you can come back, and that's your little orbiting satellite space station to make those lunar visits and to get you ready to go out to Mars. Humans to the moon by the end of the decade. And that's me being conservative. NASA. The current plan, and this is impressive, Artemis II is to get launched on November of 2024, and that is going to take four astronauts to the moon, zip around it a couple of times, and come back. It's like Apollo 8. We're not landing or we're sending people out to the moon for the first time since 1972. What's impressive and almost unprecedented they changed the date from November 2024 to September 2024. They usually don't go earlier. It's usually much, much later. So that's kind of interesting. I'm wondering if there's a political year involved in that or anything with that nature. But supposedly this September, Artemis II will go off. And then, according to the plan, if it goes correctly, Artemis III will go off in September of 2025. And that will take the first astronauts out there and actually land on the moon and have people walking on the moon once again, if everything goes correctly. So that's what they're looking for that. We've got to build some things. We've got to test some things. And then eventually we'll start to get to Mars. When? Late 2030s, early 2040s. It depends who you talk to. 2029 is a really big date for this because the Earth and Mars are pretty close and it's a nice time to get there because the opposition is a little shorter than what we've been dealing with lately. So that's an easier transfer for that. But again, we have nothing set in stone in this. We have to see how things are going to go on the moon first, be able to play with that for a while, and then head out to Mars. Orbital mechanics. The moon is not like Mars. The moon goes around the Earth once a month, and it's three and a half days to get there, no matter how fast you travel. The idea is you shoot out to the moon as fast as you can, and when you get there, you slam on the brakes halfway, enough to slow down so you go into a nice orbit. And all that's going to take about three and a half days. If something goes horribly wrong in the moon, you get to come home and it's gonna take three and a half days. Mars is different because Mars orbits around the sun. It could be over here in its orbit or over here or up there, way too far away for people from Mars to get back to earth unless it's an opposition when Mars and earth are tight. An earth year is about, well, 365 days, one year. <laughs> A um, year on Mars is about two Earth years. So once every two years, Mars gets close. We get those beautiful pictures through the telescope. 
we get the ooh and ah, and that's when we send things to Mars every two years. That's when the distance makes sense. That's important. You can't do it any other way. So if you're sending people to Mars, you're there for two years. If it takes you six months to get there, six months to get back home, you're spending about a year there on Mars. Typically a little more than that. But that's what you're basically looking at. There is no coming home early. You have to be set and ready and committed for that. Because the Earth and Mars opposition isn't always tight, sometimes it's pretty spread out, that distance is going to change between them. So a trip to Mars can take anywhere from, oh, maybe even four and a half months, if it's really a good opposition, to almost a year, which is the ones we try to avoid. SpaceX already has some plans for the red planet. As you know, Elon Musk is saying his starship is capable of reaching Mars in just 80 days in 2029 when they're a little bit closer. And it's funny because reading about this, people have been saying, no, there's no way he can do it in 80 days. Maybe 90, but not 80. Like 10 days is a big deal when you're looking at the other ones. But if that's possible, that could be a big thing. He's looking at 2029 for putting people on Mars, whether NASA's ready or not. But again, we have to see what happens there. Okay, you got three options here. 30 days, 500 days, or one way. How long would you like to be on the surface of Mars? Let's assume we can get out there fairly close. So you're going to be there for 500 days if you go right to the surface, 30 days if you go to the moon of Mars, one of the Phobos, or one way just go there and not come back. Let's look at this. 30 days. The concept here is we send a spacecraft to go out to Phobos. And then as it orbits Phobos, you send people down to Phobos and they build a space station, essentially turning Phobos into a space station, which is not a bad idea. Look, it takes our moon about a month to go around the Earth, right? Phobos zips around Mars twice a day. It's really moving. So you really get to see a lot of Mars will have an incredible perspective mm -hmm. since it's so much closer. That would be phenomenal. The idea then is as we're looking at Mars, we're like, that's the spot we want. And you send a bunch of people and they land on that part of Mars and they do some stuff. They spend uh, a week or so and then they come back to Phobos. And like, hey, let's look at that spot. And then they go down to that spot. Let's go to this one. They go there and you sample different parts of Mars. It's what we call a footsteps and flags mission. You're putting footsteps in different places. You're planting the flag. They're saying, here it is, and we're examining different terrain for a very short period of time. You're living in your spacecraft that lands and then takes off again. If you want the 500 day, we forget about Phobos entirely. If you're going to go to Mars, just do it, go to Mars and land there and set up. And now you've got a giant habitat, this huge thing that's going to start your Mars colony, and you're living in this thing for 500 days. You're going to be setting up greenhouses. You're going to be growing your own food. You're going to be exploring, setting up your energy stations, nuclear. You'll be uh, working on all sorts of different things, projects, rovers going out and back. And then you leave and you go back home. One way sounds nutty. Um, Mars One was a company that said, we can get you to Mars cheap. <laughs> Part of the problem and the expense is bringing you back home. So you don't come home. We just send you up there. And we can do this on a shoestring. And I would think going to Mars on a shoestring is something that would turn people away just right there. That's the one little comfort. But the concept there was kind of interesting. 
They tried to raise money for this. They were looking at different ways of doing it. It, it fell flat. It didn't make it. But you would take people up and they would be really crammed together in a very small spacecraft. And like, we understand, but when you get up there, you'll have a much nicer facility once we unroll this thing out. And to pay for it, you have Mars TV. So you buy the Mars channel off Xfinity or something, and you can watch what they're doing live from Mars, off the Mars station. Now, the problem here is a lot of astronaut selection. I mean, if you're taking your typical scientist and he's on the TV and saying, oh, we have a stratified rocket we found today and it has some, uh, some really interesting modules in it that contain a lot of calcium ammonia and we have uh, some other, you, you couldn't change the channel fast enough which isn't going to work. If you have characters who make this like reality TV at the other end of the spectrum, we're going out in the UVA. Take a look at Tom's face when he walks out. I turn the oxygen way down in his head. This is going to be great. Check this out. Check this out. And although entertaining, that's probably not going to work either. Um, the one-way mission, yeah, we've stayed on Earth long enough, go check out Mars, you know, kind of thing. But that's a possibility if you don't want to come back. 30 days, if you want to go to the moon, 500 days or one way. So let me see some hands here. How many for 30? How many think that's your best way? How many want to do that one? Your footsteps and flags, okay. All right. And the 500 day, just go for the surface. Let's build the colony. Let's do this. And one way, there you go. Not enough of you. <laughs> How much tougher can it be, right? <laughs> NASA, NASA likes the 30 day. It's safer. It's a lot safer. You're building infrastructure off of Phobos. Um, you just take little steps. We're taking tiny steps as we go through this thing. Eventually we'll set up a colony, but not right away. And then just take your steps down onto the moon or onto uh, Mars. These are the places they're looking at. Some of those might seem familiar to you, Jezero Crater and Gustav Crater, Gale Crater, um, Pricey Viking. It'd be great to look at the Viking uh, spacecraft, be able to land in some of these spots, Hellas Rim, of course, Hellas is the lowest part on Mars. That would be kind of phenomenal, too. Why is it safer to... I'm, I'm sorry? Why is it safer to go to that moon? Phobos doesn't have a whole lot of gravity. Phobos is weird. It's tiny, okay? It's a really tiny moon. So, as a normal guy, you could pick up a rock on Phobos that weighs about 800 pounds and move it over and put it in the position. Except it doesn't work that way because if you weighed 100 pounds on Earth, on Phobos, you would weigh one ounce, about the weight of four quarters, five quarters, and or about the weight of a, a field mouse, all right? So every time you step, you're really going to be launched up for a while. You're going to have to wait the fall back down onto it. If you had a trampoline, you could put yourself in orbit. So that's going to be the issue is just trying to stay planted on this thing. But it would be easy technically to build caves into this thing mm -hmm. and to really work it through much, much easier than working down onto the surface. If you're going to only be there for 30 days, why bother to have Well, you're going to be out here for 500 days, right? Okay. 500 days, you're going down to the surface and different ones, which will probably add up to about 30 days in the surface of Mars. Um, but the rest of the time, you'll be out there on Phobos. Okay. So on July 20th, 1989, President Bush announced at the National Air and Space Museum, it's time to take greater stride I'm directing NASA to build a space station that's going to go around the Earth and to have that done by 1999, 10 years. Another 10 years after that, I want people on the moon by 2009. And another 10 years after that, in 2019, 
people on Mars. And they told NASA, make it happen. So they got together and they worked this thing. They tried to figure it out. And the best they came up with, since we got a space station anyway, we need to make a spacecraft that's big enough to carry enough oxygen, fuel, water, all the things that we're going to need to last over two years, because you definitely want extra. And take this thing up to Mars, circle around it, we'll do footsteps and flags missions down off of this thing, and then come back. The cost was $300 billion. So no country in the world is going to pay that, so it has to be international. And since the components for it are going to be so large, we can kind of make them smaller on Earth, but then send them to the International Space Station and assemble them there and launch the rocket off of that. There was a guy in the committee who said, this is like the worst idea ever. He said, it's going to fail. And there's a lot of reasons. First, we don't have an International Space Station yet. And the thinking that we're going to have facilities on there to be engineering rocket parts for this thing doesn't make any sense. To make this gigantic rocket that you could never launch from Earth, this Battlestar Galactica, he called it, and send that thing out to Mars, he said, if anything goes wrong in that, the mission's over, everyone's gone. They only have one shot in that. And they said, history says this is not the way to go. He said, I can do it for 30 billion, about what Americans pay for pizza in a year. And here's his plan. His name was Dr. Robert Zubrin. Um, he wrote a book called The Case for Mars, and he presented this to NASA, and they were impressed. So here it is, but let me let me simplify, because this is the NASA version. They, they've added a bunch of things to this. Um, I'm going to use models. It was either that or sock puppets. So yeah, we'll go with the models. Year one, we send an Earth. Earth return vehicle, and that launches off to Mars. It gets there, and the thing lands safely, and everybody throws their fists up in there, and they're cheering, yeah, this is great, this is great. A little truck rolls out from the bottom of it, it starts to set up a generator for energy, and that is a spacecraft that's going to bring the astronauts home. There's only two problems. One, there are no astronauts there to bring home. And two, it has no fuel left. It can't leave the surface. And Zubrin's like, well, here's the ingenious part. So these little openings, uh, windows open at the top, fan starts, it sucks in Martian air. The carbon dioxide is going to interact from the Martian air with 4% of hydrogen that's left at the bottom of the tanks. It's going to take time, but a typical chemical reaction that is so simple will occur, but it's going to take about six months. But in six months, it will fill up with pure rocket fuel. And we get some extra stuff that we siphon off from that. Since we can't go to Mars every two years anyway, we can monitor this and say, it works. Yes, we have a rocket that can take off from Mars, bring you back home. It's got enough fuel to pull this off. NASA looked at this and they said, we need an ascent vehicle, an undeployed HAB. Um, the HAB is something that the rocket would take off and would connect to it. And then it gives them a little more room for that six months home, rather than just staying in this tiny rocket for that length of time. But once that's there, two years later, we send up to Mars another Earth and the HAB. Now, the HAB has people on it. This is what they're going to be living in. And as they both get out to Mars, the HAB is going to land first and land right next to the first Earth. And once that happens, this one is going to circle around and land somewhere else entirely different on the planet where they want to go next. They already have a rocket to bring them back home. They set up their greenhouse. They do all the stuff they need to do. And then two years later, they head out. If they mess up, if something horrible goes wrong and the HAB lands over here, 
far away from the earth. Then the second earth is up there. We land that next to the house. In six months, it'll be filled with rocket fuel. They can't leave for over a year anyway. They can even monitor it. They could even take the rover if it's close enough to get back over to the other earth. But every two years, you send up another half filled with people. You send up an earth return vehicle. And you just keep looking at different parts of the planet, or eventually you build a colony if you like one spot. That's his plan. NASA liked it. They wanted to put some other things to it. If we're going to bring the herb up, let's bring a supply ship and have supplies up there. So we don't have to bring them up later. So in case something goes wrong, we have that. Zubert in 1998 started the Mars Society based off of his book. I became a founding member with that group. It wasn't much longer. And as he said, no one's ever accused me of being patient. So we need to get things done. He said, I'm not looking for money. He said, I'm looking for people who are going to be committed and active and get on committees and do stuff. And your money's good too. I'd like that as well. But I need people who are going to be out there doing things. And in a very short period of time, they built the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station up on Devon Island in Canada, 76 degrees north. That's a little crater, meteor crater next to it. Very Mars like temperature wise, 60 below zero. Okay, your basic uh, everyday temperature out on Mars. The only huge difference really up there, other than the fact you can breathe the air, is if there's polar bears that are wandering around there. And as far as we know, there are no Martian polar bears that they have to be you know, weary of. So when you go out in an EVA in your spacesuits, there's one guy who's not in a spacesuit who has a rifle, who's just kind of walking along with you and uh, ready to take care of any things that would happen. It's expensive to go up to Devon Island. That's a tough one. You can't use it all year round. They built a second called the Mars Desert Research Station, and that's in Utah. This one is easy to get to, and we can have lots of people come out to this. We are coming up to our third hundred mission on this. 300 missions, international groups around the world are going. There's a group, I believe, from Belgium right out there right now. So, we're sending people out to Mars. How many and what do they do? What jobs? Talk to me. What do you think? How many people should we send in the half to get out to Mars to make this workable? And what would their jobs be? <laughs> Let's start with uh, let's start with how many? Five. 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 Anybody want lower than five? Anything lower, lower, lower? Anybody want four? Two. Two people. Two people. I got five, two, three, four, six. Anybody for six? Reducing them if you have people that have more than one area of expertise there. But if they die, then you're out. And actually, <laughs> and every single one of them better have more than one area of expertise. Absolutely. So, five, anybody for six? Seven? <laughs> Fives are our max, huh? Okay. Um, and the jobs, yes, they are going to have to share responsibilities. Everybody gets their appendix out. You don't need it anyway, and if it gets inflamed, that's a real problem for you. So that's got to go. Um, everybody is medical. Everybody has to have medical training, EMT training at least, so that we can take care of things that way. We need engineers. We need people who know how to fix things that are broken. We need to have people know how to fix things that are broken with the wrong parts and still make the thing work. That's the kind of thing we need. What about science jobs though? That'll get you, that'll keep your app working. 
of Keras. I'm sorry? Of Keras. I'm sorry. Chemists. 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 Yes, thank you. So chemists would be good looking at, okay, absolutely. We look at atmosphere, composition, right? What else? Lawyers. Lawyers. Agriculture. You know, it was funny when they first went to Australia, they had like 300 people on this ship and they come out there and it turns out nobody, nobody knew how to grow anything. The captain of the ship, when he found out we have to grow plants, said, I, I, I give my left arm for somebody who actually even had a garden that they grew in their backyard. If they had that much knowledge right. and nobody knew how to do that they had hat makers they had all sorts of different things but no botanists no agricultures and my gosh is that important right because you are he. Mm -hmm. well you're gonna have food up there but my goodness you really want to be able to set up a greenhouse and grow your own stuff to be somewhat sustainable you need to know if we can do that so that's an important one yeah anything else Chemists and biologists or botanists. Geologists. Geologists. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm biased. laughs> we, always, we always love the rocks, right? You got to have the geology with that. We got to have the geology. So those jobs. Engineers, absolutely. And you're going to need science people, right? It's part of what we're doing up there. Let's use the Mars as a research station as an example of how this will work. 2001, they got land and they put in their hab and their greenhouse. This is our first landing, 2001. So that's the first thing you got to do. Make sure the hab is secure. The thing is landed properly. Everything's good there. We're solid. We have to pull parts out and start building the greenhouse. There it is. And that's pretty much what the first colony is going to look like on Mars. That's pretty much all you're really going to be having for the most part. Now, every two years, if you want to build on to this, you can do that. You just send up new components and you just keep adding on. That's inside the greenhouse. Growing food. In this first greenhouse, it was interesting. They really didn't grow any food to eat. We didn't really have botanists. They grew food to help take care of wastewater. So I'll explain in a moment. Didn't work very well. Uh, what materials are the cab and the, for that matter, the greenhouse made of? For this one, um, I believe it was plexiglass on the outside. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, that it wasn't be, glass. That has to be engineered for the Earth, not just Mars. You don't have you have much higher wind velocity, and yeah, you know we need to understand. You got to keep it filled with oxygen, and hold on to that thought. Okay, I'll, I'll explain some of that in a moment. You're going to feed five people with the output of that dream. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're going to feed five people with the output of that. Oh, not with that, no. Okay. No. And again, you would have lots of other food, right? But our later greenhouse is going to be for growing food. And we'll see that that's uh, actually giving quite a bit. And that would actually help take care of the crew here. Our crew on this one is going to be six people. It's going to be six. Zubrin in his book said four is optimal. Four. Um, but he made a have that works for six. The hab is set up that you work downstairs and you live upstairs. So this is where you're going to be sleeping. This is your dining room, your kitchen, your biology, geology, chem labs, whatever you want is downstairs. Your EVA room, airlocks, toilets and showers are downstairs. So let's start with the airlock. 
you stand in the airlock in your space suit, you close the doors and who knows how long, it depends on whatever theory they're looking at, five minutes, 10 minutes to uh, pretend you're pressurizing. And yeah, we're talking about plexiglass and all that kind of stuff. And there's strong winds out here. You're getting winds up to 60 miles an hour more frequently than you can imagine, maybe even a little worse. But the thing is, we know how to make things airtight, but it's really expensive. So we don't make this to specs like you could take that and put it out on Mars. We're testing other things with this, how crews would react. Um, what's the best Martian diet? Um, what geology and biology experiments can we do? Every person who goes in there, all six of them, have their own mission. They have to write up, this is my agenda. This is what I want to do in the two weeks that I'm there. This is what I want to find out. And they'll mix some things up. But I remember I was on crew 10, being in the airlock, and we're sitting there waiting for the egg timer to uh, tell us it's safe to go outside. And as we're waiting, underneath the door, a lizard runs in. <laughs> it looks at us, and then he runs back out. I know, just discovered life on Mars, and okay, there it is. So, yeah, it's not airtight. But, you know, we're using the materials that we have for this. Um, they would certainly use materials for greenhouses and things that would be suitable for Mars. Mm -hmm. We have an airlock in the front. That's your main airlock that they're coming out. There's an engineering airlock in the back. Once you come into the main airlock, you're in the EVA prep room. This is where you put on your space suit. Put your tanks on, you get dressed in here, you get changed in here. And after that, you can go into the laboratory. All the lab equipment is downstairs. There's the back airlock. The bathroom. This was interesting. And the original design, when I was there, they had two toilets. Now, here's the concept. One was a normal looking toilet that had gray water. So every time you would flush this, and there was only liquids allowed in that toilet, it would go into the greenhouse and it would be filtered down by the plants and then put back into the hab in for the toilet system. Every time you took a shower, that water went down into the greenhouse. They were looking at a water recycling system is basically what they wanted to do with the greenhouse at that point. Solid waste goes in the incinolet. You put a wax paper filter on and you put that in. But you're half asleep in the morning, you get in there, you close the door, you can barely fit. And you have to make sure only solids go in that, and then only liquids go in this. So you gotta hop back and forth between both toilets to make sure you don't mix them up. Yeah, it, it wasn't fun. And once you have this, you close it and then you push a button and it incinerates everything, turns it into ash, makes it inert. It didn't work real well. It definitely is not something you really want to take up to Mars. Um, eventually, after looking through a bunch of different things, we found that the best way to handle that is called a septic system. And so on Mars, maybe they're just going to have to build a septic system eventually to handle a lot of the stuff that's there. Utah certainly said we need a septic system, you know, at this point. You walk up, we go up, climb up a ladder, you go upstairs. That's pretty nice. Comfortable, your dining room table, your meeting table, uh, work out your day. Computer off onto the side over here is for communications. Every night you have to email your stuff to NASA or mission support. Tonight, when I get home, they're on about right now. There is a whole bunch, a long laundry list of different things that they're doing today. And I'm looking for the astronomy report if there is one. And then I'll comment on that. Whole kitchen. All the comforts of home. And there's your stateroom. It is not very wide. Now, the bed is over here. She is sleeping in the top bunk. This is just a wall. On the next one, they have a bottom bunk. So they're sleeping underneath, but they can't see the other person. 
so kind of shift it off like this, which is really kind of a good way to work it. Here's one with the bottom bunk, and the person, the next one is going to be at the top. You got a little desk, you've got a bed, you've got some storage under the bed, and that's pretty much it. But you're not there to stay in your state. Okay, you're not going to be spent. You go in there, you sleep, you come out. So what are we missing? How do you deal with the like, water? I uh, mean, you can move the water uh, as other than reclaiming. We get it from town. <laughs> <laughs> and then we pump it into the water bin in the top. How would one deal with it on water? That's how you deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, for Mars, there's a couple of ways you can work this. What we really want to do is dig wells. We want a place for a habitat that has water that's going to be near the surface. And we're we're certain that water is a lot of water underneath the surface. We have so much evidence of this. And that's one way that we can do it. And of course, any water that we're going to be bringing, we need to be able to recycle. That's also vital. But if we could get that water from the ground and up, that's all you need. And boy, that would be fantastic what because is water is more precious than gold, obviously. What is the temperature of the ground there? It, it, the water would probably freeze solid. Not really. It's interesting. Here's the thing the temperature, the daytime temperature on a normal day is about 60 below zero. Okay. So if you walk down the spacesuit and you had some water, and you started to pour this thing out into a glass, it would not freeze at 60 below zero. It would actually boil yeah, because there's not enough pressure to keep it as a liquid on the surface, which is why liquid water doesn't exist there. There are some thoughts that at the bottom of that chasm in Mars, it's four miles deep, you got four more miles of atmosphere in the summer, maybe there are little pools of water that might be able to have enough pressure that they could actually seep out of the ground and stick there for a while. We're not sure about that, but that's a working theory on this. We do see places at the edges of crater where water is punched through, and we can see it running down the side of the crater, but then evaporates right away as it's, as it's going through. Uh, uh, two questions. One, do they operate on Mars time or Earth time? For this? Yes. That's a great question. Um, they would have to figure out their own time on the red planet as, as to how they want to work that. There is no mission control because you don't control anything. It's mission support. And for us, they work on Mountain Standard Time since that's for their living, you know, with that. And for the other follow-up question, you talk about drilling down for water. Um, most drilling I, I'm familiar with uses water as a lubricant for drilling. So would they have to fly up some amount of water initially for the drilling operation? That's for the engineers to figure out, <laughs> right? That's for them to work on. Yeah. But yeah, that, that would be certainly a big project for them to, to handle for that. But yeah, the water for here comes from town. Yeah. Isn't Mars time at 24 and a half or 25 hours for a day? Yeah, yeah the day is about 40 minutes longer than what we have here. Okay, typically so 24 hours, 40 minutes. Just add another 40 minutes to your day. It's not bad. The seasons are just twice as long. Why two airlines? I'm sorry? Why two airlines? Why two airlines? Oh, why two airlocks? In case there's a problem with one, you can still get escape. You can still get out. Yeah. It's always good to have some kind of redundancy. The second airlock is going to come in handy in a moment in the what are we missing category, all right? So yeah, I, I have an uh, idea about what you're missing. The <laughs> energy, it seems like you've got this greenhouse that's gonna be need to be heated. The living quarters are gonna have to be heated. And uh, where are you getting the energy to keep everybody warm and keep the, keep the plants from freezing? If we were actually on Mars, we're looking nuclear. That would be your easiest bet. That's the easiest way. And you're going to have that thing off of cable in a way, way distant crater in order to do that. For us here, 
we can't do nuclear in Utah is really again so there's a lot of problems with us doing that in Utah mm -hmm. so we have to go with uh, generator and which means we're going to need fuel as well to uh, run this so if you want to think about what we're missing how about energy instead of using that what would you bring in what would be a better energy source plutonium <laughs> solar. solar solar definitely okay and solar would work on mars it's a little farther from the sun but it, it would still work for mars okay so that's a possibility so one thing we could have is a better energy thing we could bring solar in anything else because we're we're going to add things onto this every two years so we want to bring solar panels up for one of them what else do we want windmills. Windmills. Yeah. Windmills. Is it, windy? it is windy mm -hmm. it is windy Thin atmosphere, no? yeah. It is a thin atmosphere, so you can have a, a dust devil that's huge, and if it was heading straight toward you, you just stand still and it goes right over you and you just brush the dust off and that's it. It's not enough to lift you up. See, that's the problem because it's the atmosphere is so thin. Is it enough to generate energy? Yeah, that I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that... We're not really looking at wind for Mars for that. But solar. Yeah, the Anything else? What is the atmospheric what? pressure? So you're you're bringing the wrong people here. Nah. I don't want a botanist making a mistake that I'm a live in. I don't want a chemist making it. I don't want a geo a geology guy making it. You gotta send teamsters up to Mars. <laughs> you gotta send people to oh, build this stuff. Keep in mind, you get all this stuff built. The teamsters then, already then, made it on Earth. It's coming in already done and just lands. Yeah, but you, you know, okay. You, 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 they already did all that and figured all that stuff back on Earth. All right. <laughs> the teamsters, so this just landed as one unit. You can't be out there to build. You got to live somewhere while you build. I like the fact that everybody's going to be EMT, but you need engineers. I want people definitely that build things and manufacture things and fix things. I need someone who knows electric and plumbing and all sorts of things. And then when all this gets set up, then you bring. The scientists. Oh, well, it's already set up when it arrives. Yeah, and that's the thing. In theory, what what kind of? No, it's been built on Earth. It's traveling out in space to land. You know, yeah, but if there. it lands and one of those red things breaks, the bodies can be able to fix it. Or <laughs> <laughs> but you have engineers on there who could. That's right. You well, have to have engineers. That's what, the most, what probably kind the most of important. Do you have for the engineer to work with to repair anything? Good question. Raw materials. Or... It would be interesting. Let's say one of the struts breaks and they can't fix it. Okay, and this is a really good, uh, good lesson in this. If that's the case, and they, it's going to be unstable and they can't use it, then they just get in the urban they head out. Okay, but the thing is, they can't go home, so they're going to have to make do. You're going to have to deal with what you have. Now, on the Flashline Station, when they took this thing out to Devon Island, that's so remote. They had this thing dropped in by parachute, the pieces to put together. And that's where you need your Teamsters up in Devon Island or here to assemble this thing, all right? <clears throat> and they dropped the things in, and some of them hit the ground so hard, the crates broke open and a whole bunch of pieces broke. All right, to the point they're like, what do we do? How do we put this thing together? And they said, well, okay, we can't. We're just going to have to scrap this. We're going to have to do that. A couple of people who were up there, who were going to be the astronauts on this thing, and their, their job was just to build it. They went out at night, and they started putting the thing together. And they came up with some ingenious ways to get away from the broken pieces in order for the thing to work. And it looks like that. They were able to actually do it so that they could live in it and continue their mission. So that's the attitude of the people we want who are going to be there because they're going to be highly motivated. You can't come home early. You just can't. That's one thing you can't do. So you're going to have to deal with whatever comes on for that.
let's look at what we're dealing with here. 2001, right? 2003, Mars and Earth come around again as far as our scenario. They decided to build an astronomical observatory, <laughs> which is probably, even in my head, really on the low end of the scale for this as the things you need. But it doesn't always work that way. Because in science, as with politics, it depends where you get the money. And Elon Musk said, yeah, here's some money. Go build an observatory to Mars Desert Research Station. And that's where I got involved. Subert <laughs> called me and said, hey, can you build an observatory out there and uh, get this thing working? And I said, yeah, make it remote. And I said, I, I can do that. And it was 2002 that I went out to do that. I had two weeks to build it and get it set up and operating. He had the crew before put a concrete pad up on the bridge. That's where he wanted it. So it's really a cool look. Um, do you have any idea, and you would, how difficult it is to get a dome in two weeks? <laughs> All right. All right. I, I had a month. I had one month. Um, I found a, a serious dome that somebody was selling that was in their driveway. I said, we'll take it. You know, ship it out there, get the thing going, and you know, we'll do what we can. But the observatory was set up thanks to Elon Musk and uh, 2003, we got the thing operational. We had first light the last day of my mission there, New Year's Day. Well, that didn't last. Um, basically, let's go back. As the years went by, I had more and more difficulty with it until the point where the dome was really having trouble operating. And if you put a marble on the concrete pad, it would roll to the one end because putting concrete on a scree slope is not your best move, all right? And although I gave them, here's the depth I want, here's the depth of the pier, the guy said, well, it was really hard to dig into that. So your concrete's this thick for everything. No fear. I was thinking, well, that's really going to shift over time, and it did. So I said, it's got to come down. So in 2012, I moved it down into the valley in the one nice concrete uh, pad, and we had it situated there. Nothing else has really happened just because of lack of funds. Um, yeah, greenhouse fire. Now, that's a big deal. I forgot to set up the fire then. Yeah, um, I got to tell you, the crew that was there was able to save the hab, which was pretty impressive. So fiberglass, you know, and then different things, plexiglass, fiberglass coming across this thing. This would be catastrophic on Mars. And this is something you certainly have to get replaced right away if you were on the red planet. I mean, we all looked at the Martian, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to have that food. How did they put the fire out? How, how did they put the fire out? Fire extinguishers, I believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see in a, a spent canister there, but they didn't have yeah. that many. What caused the fire? So I'm not sure what caused it, to be honest. On uh, Mars, would that fire be self limiting? There's no oxygen, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So as soon as it breaks free, it's done. Yeah. That would well, who detected the fire? How did they detect it? There ought to be alarms. Uh, there weren't at that time. Not on that one. They, they were in the hab. They were in the hab. And I guess they noticed smoke coming uh, from the windows upstairs. Yeah, there ought to be sensors for sure. Yeah. Because if everybody's sleeping <laughs> and you get a fire, Oh, the, the HAB has smoke detectors and it has carbon monoxide detectors. The greenhouse did not. Yeah. Nobody sleeps in the greenhouse. But they built a new greenhouse. We got that up in 2015. They got an influx of money. So 2016, our next crews arrive and they build a science dome. We've outlived everything downstairs. There's a giant dome. In 2016, oh, here's the inside. So now we don't have to have that stuff in the bottom of the half. We can use that for other things. And they have a nice clean room and a lot more room to work out here. 
We got the RAM, the repair and assembly module. This was an old part of an airplane, which is really kind of cool. At the back end, there's actually a garage we could roll one of the uh, vehicles inside to work on. So the engineers were real happy. You need that. And they built tunnels. Yes, I know that we have some huge gaps in certain places, but the idea is I can go out the back airlock, dress just like this, and go out to the science dome or the greenhouse or the observatory or the ram, hold your breath and just run that last distance or something. I don't know. But then you don't have to put on a space suit. To have. If you're doing an EVA, you go out the front door, out that airlock. If you want to go out to any of the others, you got to use the tunnel system and head out. 2018, we got money to build another observatory. So we took the Musk Observatory and I said, well, we don't need two observatories for the same thing. Let's put a hydrogen alpha telescope in that one. So we'll use that for solar and we'll use this for deep sky. This one is completely robotic. So there's no tunnel, not necessary. And how this thing works is that you would go online. Students can use it. The dome will open automatically. It'll take the pictures. Everything goes in the queue. They can grab the stuff right off of their uh, computers in the morning. Mm -hmm. Hey, we finally got them. Solar powered panels, 2018. So we have some nice solar powered panels for energy. We still keep the generator as a backup, but it's really not necessary. Um, this does a really good job and gives us more energy than we need. So here we are again. This is what it looks like today with all the tunnels, everything. You can see the observatory way in the back up there, just sitting out by itself, the robotic one. So what do we add now? A rover or some, some vehicle to get around. I'm sorry? A, a rover or some kind of vehicle. We'll talk about that next. Very good. Yeah, transportation. We definitely need to look at transportation. Weren't there four wheelers in the other picture? Yeah. I'm sorry? There were four wheelers in a couple of the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll look at those. Yeah. And we'll look at the concept of that. We want to look at the concept. They got some money now from Jeff Bezos, enough to build another half. So the big question is do you build another half and put it nearby this one? We're building a colony, you put the two halves next to each other, and you're starting to work that. Or do you put it behind around the corner there where you can't see this one and only have it like a first contact mission, just that in a greenhouse to have two different experiences? This is the campus, this is the settlement being started, the other one's just your first one going on. Thoughts? You could start out with that concept and then add to it as time goes on. You want to, oh, with the other one around the corner? Yeah. yeah, if they did that, they would only want to keep that as a single, this is where we first landed kind of experience. Mm -hmm. So it'd be two different crew experiences. You don't have all the uh, extras. Mm -hmm. And this one would be two halves with all the extras on there, like you're really building a settlement. Yeah, why not go for redundancy? I'm sorry, what? Redundancy is always good in these situations. I would say then do, do it like that. How many like that idea of putting the halves together? How many like uh, just having the halves supper? The Mars Society? Right now, they don't like either one. <laughs> now, and the reason is administration. It is hard enough training six people to live in a hab and do everything correctly in two weeks. We're going to double that to 14. It'll be a nightmare. Um, there has to be some better semblance. This. Maybe the missions have to be longer, but we're looking at college students. We're looking at some NASA scientists. Two weeks seems to be 
the time we have to get things going and move things through. Perhaps the mission should be longer, but if you're going to make them longer, let's make them more realistic. I mean, there's a lot of stuff here that can't be realistic, like it's not airtight, for instance, you know, those kinds of things. If you're going to make another half, do not make that one. <laughs> the outside will look exactly the same. Put three stories in, not two. The ceilings aren't as tall. Hey, let's put a window in each of the state rooms. Let's have an exercise room in. We don't have that. Let's have a fallout shelter in, which they would certainly have if they were traveling from Earth out to Mars. That hab is the best we could think of back in 1999. We have different ideas now. So a different hab would certainly be, uh, a different setup would be better. Transportation, we always see those really cool looking rovers and uh, these RVs that are going out on Mars. Zubrin has a lot of problems with that. He thinks that the worst part of that is simply if it gets stuck, you're stuck. You're done. Again, it's kind of like the Battlestar Galactica thing going out to Mars on one ship. So he really likes having ATVs. <clears throat> Chance of getting this stuck are pretty slim, but you're not sleeping in them either. He said one can carry a trailer when you're ready to stop for the night. It has a pop-up tent. You inflate, has the oxygen. You can sleep in that. Um, maybe a better idea would be to have both. Have a rover that's carrying along an ATV or two of them, you know, that can help to pull it out of a ditch in case it gets stuck, you know, that kind of thing. Daily life, our astronauts get up, they have breakfast, just like we do, brush their teeth, do the, what they need to do, and head out to the science lab or head out to the RAM. It's the inside of the RAM there, and inside your science lab, or go out to the observatory. Are working on that. Typically, every day they've got an EVA schedule. Some people are going to be heading out. And as they do, then we get a chance to see different things, collecting rock samples or learning more about traveling out on Mars. And EVAs are a lot of fun. Not everybody can go on an EVA. We need somebody back that's going to be connected to them by radio. So if they have any problems, they'll know and they can deal with that. They've had different things where they simulate emergencies on EVAs and different things of that nature. And spacesuits. We tried different types of spacesuits to see what really works. There's no oxygen in those tanks. It's a big fan that's blowing air in your face because otherwise when you're breathing, that whole thing is going to mess up and you're not going to be able to see anything. You can't do anything about it. It fogs up on the inside. So you have air hoses that are just blasting air in on you. But looking at different types of spacesuits is something else that we also want to check. I have the astronomy component. The Musk Observatory is a month 100 uh, telescope inside. Mm -hmm. And give some nice images of the sun. Although if you're a crew astronomer, you're not wearing a spacesuit in there. So that really wouldn't be the case. Everything would have to be cameras and automatic. You typically really wouldn't go out to the observatory at all. You just stay in the hab and work off your computer, taking images, getting what you need to do. But that's not the case with this one. We have a camera on it. We also have an eyepiece. But that one has to be controlled manually. The robotic observatory does not. There's not even a door to the thing. you got to get a ladder and crawl over the top of the dome. I have a 14-inch Celestron. And down here, we've got a 70 millimeter stellar view. So we've got a wide field and we've got a research. This is all the photometric filters. This is gonna have your pretty picture camera. And this is all automatic. There is no eyepieces that can be put on this. It's just simply gonna be cameras, filters, and everything that works with it. It's part of the Skynet Robotic Telescope Network. 
And what you do is once you're on this, add new observation, and then you put what you want in, you pick out the filters, you pick out the exposure time, you hit submit, and it comes up active. When you check in, it's completed, and you can click on it, and you can get your image. And you can download it, and you can do whatever you want to do. Students have been working with this thing all around the world and uh, other researchers. Okay, so if you're on Mars, what do you want to image? I've got an observatory up there. Now what am I going with? What am I looking at? Earth, Earth. Earth. Earth would be a cool thing to see. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Nearby stars or nearbys. We could do the basic stuff, yeah, that we have here, right? Check out Deimos and Phobos. The moons, absolutely. Phobos, Deimos would be phenomenal. You're in a unique position. In here, you're closer to Jupiter and you're closer to Earth. Jupiter would appear to be larger than Earth, but not by much, actually. Not by much when Earth gets out the opposition. Earth will be pretty large, and you'll be able to see the moon fairly well. And I'll show you a, a picture of that. Um, How about asteroids? asteroids? Right? Asteroids would be a big one because the asteroid belt is right there. So you really want to monitor asteroids uh, very carefully with that. You would want to look at the sun. Solar flares are a big deal, right? So you definitely want to have something uh, solar. And we could do the standard deep sky stuff, the nebulas, the, the clusters, the galaxies. But we got to think like a Martian. There's something else we can do on Mars that you could not do on Earth. X-ray and gamma ray. Mars atmosphere will allow those to come through. Ours will not. So you could have an X-ray and gamma ray observatory on the surface of Mars and be able to uh, work with that rather than a telescope. You could do that. Yeah, big big question there is uh, why wouldn't you do that on the moon? A lot easier to get material to the moon and uh, people back and forth, and you have the the same advantage, even less atmosphere on the moon. Well, no atmosphere as far as the moon goes. Yeah. That would be exactly. pretty good. Um, we've always talked about having radio astronomy on the far side of the moon. And we're looking at radio astronomy on Mars here in a moment as well. The moon would be pretty good for all of those things as well. It really would. Because you don't have an atmosphere. Now, our problem on the moon is if you want to do nighttime astronomy, you got two weeks in a row to do it, but it's not going to be cloudy. And then you have two weeks of daytime. So, you know, you're going to be uh, working about two weeks at a time, which is not a big deal. Mars is going to have some problems that the moon wouldn't experience with that. Temperature is going to be a problem on either world. That would be a problem. And we'll look at that. Uh, variable stars. Yeah, we could do that. We do that here on Earth, but there's no great advantage of doing it on Mars rather than on the Earth. Exoplanets, less atmosphere, you might be able to get better resolution for exoplanets. Martian moons, that's an actual picture. Yeah, we're looking at, we don't call that an eclipse, but that's a transit, and that's Phobos in the sun. Really phenomenal. So, yeah, the Martian moons would be really cool to see. And there's your Earth and Moon. That's from Mars? From Mars. That's how you would see it, yep. That's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. That is pretty neat. I mean, our moon is big, big enough that you'd be able to see some detail. I mean, look, we get details of Jupiter's moons from here now, right? Mm -hmm. So, Imagine our ZWO cameras checking out the Earth and the, the moon from Mars would be pretty phenomenal. That's pretty amazing that Mars is really just a bright looking star from here. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Earth would look like a little blue star there, but you know, you telescope in and this is what you're getting. 
that's about the emission when you make the Radio astronomy. And of course, you would want to set up an array on the far side of Mars, or not on the far side, the far side of the moon you would, but here would be good because you don't really have any radio interference. So you have a really big advantage with that. And again, our radio waves down to submillimeter are coming down here on Earth, so that's not a problem, same on Mars. The problems, cold. Now, on the moon, you're looking at 300 below zero and 300 above. So you have hot and cold. Here on Mars, you're looking at basically cold. This is a telescope that is near the South Pole. All right. Um, just to put into perspective, I talked to Celestron. They said their hand control is good to 40 degrees. All right. Yeah, they don't recommend you using it under 40. So I hope no one's been yes. doing that. Yeah. Right. Nobody does astronomy under 40 degrees. So, yeah, this is uh, pretty major stuff when you're looking at uh, the lubricants and everything else that you have to do to keep this going. But working and putting telescopes at the South Pole is a good way to learn on how to do them on Mars and how to work them. That wind, it may not be enough to run a turbine, but it certainly does create a lot of dust. And some of those are global dust storms that will cover you up for quite some time. So you definitely want the observatories to be airtight. You need to be able to shut things down. And of course, radiation. As always, it doesn't have the magnetic field. So you can do X-ray and gamma ray astronomy out there, you know, on the surface. But that's going to be a problem. You're not going to be out at the observatories. Again, you're going to be inside the half as far as things go. Any other questions? Yeah, what materials are going to be available on Mars? Are they going to be able to make concrete or what are they going to be able to dig out of the ground? Absolutely. Mars has all the stuff we need in building, even to make steel and glass. Martian glass would be kind of interesting looking, very different from Mars. Um, but it has all of those things that you use in industry, except we don't have the botanicals. You can't make medicine, and we don't have petroleum from the botanicals and all that kind of stuff. So you're not going to be able to get propane and oil and that stuff in Mars. But any of the other stuff, yeah, and concrete, you just need water and uh, you'll have all the other stuff to make it. Got the sand, lime. And more energy. More energy? Yeah. Well, besides keeping everybody from freezing, you know, the, it takes a lot of energy to make concrete. You, oh, you, yeah. You've got to grind up the rocks and. Right, right, right. But if you, you have nuclear power, you've got your energy, you know, as far as okay. that. So, so all you have to do is build a nuclear power plant first, and then and then you're good. Is that is that the idea? The nuclear power plant's not like what uh, we have in Limerick, PA. It's uh, it'll be very very different, and it's going to be something that's going to be buried in the ground, but it's going to have some radioactive material that's really going to be giving off a lot of energy, and just kind of working like yeah, yep. Yeah. The same thing they use in the spacecraft, just on a larger scale. Yeah. Still have it. And what about dealing with the physiological um, issues that could develop in the human body, which is what we're dealing with with the space station and with the long term? Um, so, one of the things they've really looked at is when you send the HAB up, it's going to take six months to get to Mars, let's say. Instead of just having it go out to Mars, let's take the top off on a cord, a cable, and let's start to rotate it. Mm -hmm. So we're not weightless. Now we have gravity because the thing is spinning around. And make the cable long enough so that instead of weighing 100 pounds, you weigh 38 pounds, what you'd weigh on Mars when you would arrive. You now have six months of living on Mars. You have six months to get used to living on Mars. When you get there, you work outside, it just feels normal as far as that goes. But you would still have to exercise and do what needs to be done 
so your muscles don't atrophy from the, the reduction in weight. It's always good to exercise, yeah. right? That's that's never a problem. Yeah, and uh, you need to exercise, but if you're not weightless, the problem with being weightless and not exercising is all your blood is flowing into your middle. The astronauts, when they go up, they have suspension pants because they gain an inch in their waist just because of all the blood pulling up toward the core. Mm -hmm. And exercising pushes the blood out into the arms and the legs, and you want to keep doing that as much as you can. Now, if you have gravity, your blood is staying out there in your arms and legs, but you still want to exercise. You still want to keep in shape. I Obviously. recently read something where they were comparing the twins. I can't remember the name. Scott and Kelly. 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 Yeah. And um, one of them, the one that was in space, his brain shrunk. Mm -hmm. And there are other physiological effects like loss of calcium mm -hmm. that nobody can figure out. You know, you lose calcium. doesn't matter how much calcium they give you beforehand. You just get rid of it, but your calcium level just kind of drops down. And the more you go into space, the more brittle your bones are eventually going to become. Right. Now, it, it stops. It goes down, then it levels out. But you go up into space again, it drops and levels out again. And so that, that's kind of a weird thing. And there are physiological things that we need to see, but that's stuff we study in the International Space Station to prepare for that. And if they don't want to turn this thing and flip around, which to me seems easy enough. I mean, once you get there, you just jettison the cable on that end piece and then you land as far as that goes. But you would want them to have gravity, I would think, for that amount of time. But we've had people on the International Space Station, as long as they work out, they're fine. But once they get there, you know, it's going to be a little different. It won't be as much of an adjustment as you would on Earth because you don't weigh as much on Mars. 38 pounds instead of uh, 100 if you weighed 100. Who's funding this project now? For the Mars Society? Mm -hmm. It's privately funded. So they have donations that come in and uh, that sort of thing, which is why they have stuff uh, with that. But Jeff Bezos, like I said, just gave uh, quite a lot of money to them. So pretty happy with that. And uh, they work with funding all the time. Okay. Where is this located in Utah? Near Hanksville, you know, what, huge I mean, metropolis, 401 people. <laughs> All right. Northern or south, northern or south. Uh, near Capitol Reef, um, Green River. So you're looking over into the eastern part of the state. If I'm going out there, I'm going to fly into uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, and then zip across the border and down Arches. Is a little closer to the eastern coast, moved in the other side. Lake Powell is nearby. Okay. Um, does NASA communicate with, with the Mars Society? Or the yes, they do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Good. And they've had people out there. Great. Not anymore, though, really, because NASA has decided to build their own Mars habs to test in Hawaii and some other different places for that. And they make those airtight, they got more money. Um, so they they make those a little more airtight and uh, try to work those through. But well, it would be uh, a good thing though to, it's, to for them to still exchange ideas and and oh yeah, guys and, stuff. and that, that's, that's all good. part of it. That's all part of it. I think they would stop that. So I mean, and the people come up with all sorts of creative research projects. So um, what's your best Martian diet? What's your best Martian exercise program? They've they had those kinds of things. Um. They've had fun with uh, commanders. They had a whole bunch of guys and then a female commander, one woman uh, on the command thing. They had a whole bunch of Americans and one French commander. <laughs> you know, they, they did all sorts of different odd setups with this just to kind of see what they can do. I think the problem there is really you're together for two weeks. You can certainly get along with uh, five other people in a closed campaign for two weeks, you know, without too much problem. You're all there for the same reason. Although you'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some cases where it just really doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. So we learn about that too. We want to know about the human dynamics and uh, what are the stress points for all that psychological uh, evaluations and that kind of stuff. That's all important. So you, you did two, you've done two trips? 
I had one trip as an astronaut on there. Let's see, number 10. We're now up to almost 300, 280, 290 something. So you, you, so you only went once? I've, I've been out there as an astronaut once. I go out every year. Oh, okay. To do work on the observatories, but I have no interest in getting dressed up in spacesuits and was waiting in airlocks, you know. Oh, got it. <laughs> and when I was out there, I didn't. I was out of sim a lot of times because I don't have the time to do that. And I'm not going to be building an observatory in a spacesuit, you know. So I go up there and do my job. And then some days, like, I'd oh, love to go out in an EVA. Yeah, go for it. Get the spacesuit, go out there, drive the, you know, thing around and take the afternoon and do that. Got so, it. but. I wasn't fully ensconced with that. I had to deal with that. But I'm running in and out of the hab all night, you know, <laughs> t-shirt and shorts and, you know, do what I can. But yeah, every year I go out with the astronomy team and we work on the observatories and clean them up, get all the dust off of them and uh, make any repairs that are necessary. But you stay in the hab, right? Oh, I stay in the hab, yeah, yeah absolutely. You just don't play the game or yeah, yeah, you call no, it. No, don't drive the rovers, don't get in the uh, spacesuits, just mm -hmm. uh, Get food from town, bring it in. Go out to dinner in town. <laughs> yes, I, was to, I see what's the oh, cluster of stuff <laughs> like kind of up near the picture of you. Yeah. Is that right, a parking lot? Right up in there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if I'm out there, you're gonna see a rental vehicle here. And you know, <laughs> typically we go into town for dinner. Yeah. You know, we've been out in the desert all day. It's hot. It is, you know, it's okay. Now over here we've got two um RVs or um not RVs, what am I thinking? No, just trailers, you know, um, where people are living. And that's the station manager lives on site. So if there's a problem, they're there. You cannot see them because of this hill here, which is really nice. In the old days, you said the generator over here, we'd have to fill up with gas every night to you know, make sure we made it through and all of that. But we now have one, four VIPs that are visiting. So the uh, manager, the MDRS manager lives in one, and then the IPs for the mm -hmm. other. He needs some help with that. And then they have their vehicles. They typically drive around that way to go into town rather than pass. Mm -hmm. We don't want uh, any of, you know, it, it kind of takes away from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the people on EVAs yeah. always say they're out there in their spacesuits, and people will come oh, up to them in the it. desert, mm -hmm. and they'll look mm -hmm. at them, and they'll start talking, and like, we, we can't talk around an EVA and uh, we need to, you know, keep moving. We only have so much oxygen. And the person out there will say, you can take your helmet off. You can breathe out here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really their point, but. Cool. It, was fun. it looks like there's been some chatter in the chat. We've not been monitoring it. If anyone oh. online has something to say or you can, if you want to take a look at the chat. <clears throat> How will the solar panels be clean? <laughs> I don't know with the crag towel. I right. get I don't know. I know. I've never really seen them very dirty. And there's a lot of dust out there, but there's a lot of wind out there too. There's a lot of wind. So a lot of it's not just dust. A lot of it's not just dust. If you if you live in Utah, you find that you like living at the beach. Because of the sand that gets into the house mm -hmm. from the, from the wind. Oh, well, I've got a lot of sand in the observatories. I got to deal with every year I go out there. Yeah, you know, and the optics are dirty. You know, it's just that's it. But I mean, these things are just out in the open. I don't know who's cleans those. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that done yet. Do, okay, what do they do in what in the winter time? Mm -hmm. Is that Still subject to the cold of the winter. So you're out in the desert, so it's not the daytime and the temperature drops at night. What what do they do? Does it snow in that area? <laughs> okay, so here's our here's our weather. If it rains, you go nowhere. I don't you're you're not going into town that night, you're eating in the half. Because all of a sudden the desert turns into mud. Right. Yeah. It will stick to your tire. And by the time you get out to about here, your tires are now bald and are just uh -huh. covered with mud. And once that hardens, it's almost impossible to get. You really got to chip away at that. So you just leave the vehicle and uh, it will harden up pretty fast. 
the rains don't really last. There's not much water. I've been there when there's snow. And I figured that if you want to make a snowman, your best bet is to go out early and make it out of mud <laughs> and then let the snow cover it. All right. Yeah. And then you got it. You're there. But you're not going to have enough snow to make a snowman. Um, the snow will be down there and it's going to disappear probably within a day and then turn back in the mud. So we haven't had uh, difficulties with snow that way. Cool. Any final questions online or? Looks like somebody wants to swing. Yeah. Radiation. Yeah, we need a swimming pool. Psychologist. <laughs> Oh, my, my speaker's out of focus. Uh, no, that's how I normally look. <laughs> it's just not out of focus. I normally look that way. Oh, okay. It looks like there was a camera issue at the very beginning, but. Okay. okay. Cool. I mean, it's a self focusing yeah. camera. Yeah. Any final questions? Yeah. Do you know, oh. know the approximate atmospheric pressure on Mars? Like it's 14.7. Pounds per square inch. Yeah, yeah I, I think Zubrin had said, I don't know the number, but he said it's about what we have at 100,000 feet here on Earth, is what you have at the so surface it's there. Down, down to about zero. Well, yeah. Very yeah. little. Yeah. Yeah. Since there's no atmosphere, how will radiation that would come to the surface of Mars affect the people that are living there? If you, well, what you're going to have to have is a solar monitor that's going to tell you about solar flares coming. That would be the worst part. What about cosmic rays and x rays? Okay. Well, that's when your x rays and your gamma rays are really going to be the strongest coming out from the sun. So you're going to have to have a fallout shelter. You would have to have one inside the half or you go into a cave. Now, the most deadly parts of a solar storm only last for a few hours. So once that's done, your green light goes back on, you're safe to go back outside. What about just the day in and day out? Again, with no... Day in and day out, your biggest issue there is not going to be x-rays and gamma rays mostly, because the sun doesn't give off a lot of that. So, unless it's really, really active. So the biggest part is going to be more, it's going to be stronger in your ultraviolet. Okay, so you're going to have more harmful ultraviolet than you would uh, and have to deal with that than you would here on Earth. Well, but your spacesuits, of course, are going to be like the ones that you wear on the moon, yeah. the same type of thing. You're going to have to metal on the inside of this thing, a radiation barrier, some lead to uh, take care of that. What's the elevation of that place? I'm sorry, what is the, the elevation of that? Oh, elevation out here is around 4,000 feet. About zero? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I guess, you know. Yeah, out there. Yeah, this is about three hours. You have to, have to, when you're living in there, you have to really, really be careful of this. You can get literally sunburned walking from your house to the bottom of the driveway. Oh, yeah. And I've been out there in the summer. And, it's, uh, it's brutal. And the other thing is scorpions and uh, tarantulas every now and again. <laughs> hey, I walked in the lab one morning at 3 a.m. and I was a tarantula. Really, he looked at me. I looked at him like, yeah, I might interject here. Actually, um, if there's any final questions, um, I do believe we have refreshments, so I don't mean to cut this completely off, but but maybe we should transition to uh, even more informal, uh, eat some snacks and continue our conversation. But Peter, thank you so much.